done it not only once. I've been shot at a number of times in a number of places around the world. And every time, God has miraculously saved my life. This is, this is God's Word. So John, this is not just John talking. It's not just the Holy Ghost yes. talking. God is talking. Eating up the stories that he would tell of his missions and ministry, and it would build my faith. So all of heaven is watching the earth all the time, looking for a man or a woman that's going to use the Word of God, that's going to speak the Word of God, that's going to move on the Word of God. And when they do, heaven moves. you know this or not, but hell hates you. I mean, seriously, uh, I don't think the church understands that, that you have a target on your back and hell would kill you in a New York minute if it could. That's why we have to stay alert because there is an enemy and it's not necessarily a situation where you do something wrong. Every time somebody dies or gets sick or gets in trouble, a bunch of church folks say, what did they do wrong? What did they do wrong? What sin did they get? Sometimes they didn't do anything wrong. They're just an enemy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for, for centuries, we've sent young men off to war, and now the stupid thing we do is send young women off to war. What a ridiculous thing that is. And they don't do anything wrong at all. But there's an enemy, and they get killed. Because there's snipers out there and there's IEDs out there and there's evil stuff going on out there. And they just get killed because they're in war. You know, when I was in the army, they, uh, you know, we went through, at that time we went through 13 weeks of boot camp. Nowadays, I, the sissy military nowadays goes through like six weeks. What are you going to do in six weeks? Man, they put us through hell for 13 weeks. <clears throat> I've got two grandsons just finished the Air Force, and, and, and they, they said, oh, Papa, pray for us. You know, and you were in boot camp. I said, how long are they? They said, six weeks. I said, <laughs> I said, you're in the Air Force. You're in San Antonio, Texas, and they don't even send you outside because it's hot. You're in air conditioning. That's not the military. Six weeks in air conditioning? They used to tell us to assume the position. That means get in a push-up position. And they took a bayonet and stuck it under our belly. And you just stayed up there or you got the point. I mean, you stayed there. I mean, shaking, trembling. St and sadly, you know, a few guys didn't make it. But that's not nice anymore, so they don't do that anymore. But you know, in, in, in those 13 weeks, the whole point of the exercise of that 13 weeks, the whole point, because every military guy and woman will tell you, that was senseless. That was the dumbest thing I ever did. None of that stuff, none of that stuff made any sense. Oh, it made perfect sense. Because what the whole point, the whole point of boot camp is to get you trained to not think, yeah. Yeah. but to obey. Because we were on our way to Vietnam. And uh, they wanted you to understand that when your platoon sergeant or drill sergeant or whoever you're with said, hit the deck, they didn't want you to think about that. They didn't want you getting over there in the mud and the blood and the beer and the mosquitoes and the, and the snakes and the, and the stuff. And your platoon sergeant says, says, on your face. And you say, why? But I don't want to. Yeah. But it's dirty. Yeah. But I don't want to get in the mud. Well, now you're dead. Because yeah. yeah. right. when he says get on your face or hit the dirt, you need to get your face in the mud and get as low as, get as, low as you can. Yeah. And that's the whole point of boot camp. 
all that, all that drilling and close order drill and about face and right face and do you do that for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours? You, you never do that again in your life. It makes no sense at all, except it's to train you to obey orders and don't think. Do what you're told. Well, God's the same way. He invented that. With God, you don't get a vote. You don't get an opinion. I've made so many churches mad, Morgan, because I've told them you don't get a vote and you don't get an opinion. And people just say, but I, but I want an opinion, Brother Terry. You don't get one. God said, do it, do it. Yeah, but no. Yeah, but, but no. But I, no. But I, no. I don't even want to hear it. I have people come to me, and I know every minister has always had this happen to them. They come and say, now, 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 now Pastor Noel, here's how God deals with me. No, he doesn't. You're not special. He deals with you the same way he deals with everybody else. He says, do it. And he expects you to do it. He says, hit the dirt. He expects you in the dirt. Right? He doesn't want your opinion. Can you imagine God when you say, when you say, now, Lord, here's what I think. Oh, but God says, oh, wait, let me get my pen and paper. I, 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 I need to hear this. I may want to rewrite the Bible. Once I find out what you think, then I'm going to, we'll be, we'll be good. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't want to hear what you think. The military doesn't want to hear what you think. See, we're soldiers under command. They came to Jesus over in the book of Luke and they said, Jesus, you preached good over there the other night. They want you to come back and do a, do a two-week revival. And he said, oh, no, no. He said, I must go to the next cities also. For thereunto am I sent. See, he knew he was sent. It wasn't his choice. He didn't get to do what he wanted to do. He said, I do what I hear my father, what I, what I see my father do. I say what I hear my father say. I don't do my own thing. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. Well, so did you. So did I. I'm not here to do what I please. I'm here to do what he pleases. Jesus knew he was a soldier under command. He was under orders and that he was sent. And so he wasn't willing to saturate one area with the gospel at the expense of another. The apostle Paul, same way. He wasn't willing to. He'd preached all over the whole known world. And then he said, I've got to go to Rome. I owe them the gospel. He said, I'm in debt, Romans chapter one. I'm in debt, I'm a debtor. I owe the gospel to them that are at Rome also. Well, he could have just sat back and put his feet up and, you know, made podcasts and written, written books and just, you know. I mean, he preached everywhere. He's already an old guy. But he said, I, I, I can't help it. I'm in debt. See, the church has never felt like she was in debt. Paul said, I'm in debt. I'm a debtor. I owe the gospel. To those that are at Rome also. That's right. Everybody has the right to hear. Yes. My spiritual father, Wayne Myers, we just came back as Renee said from Mexico City to be with him. He's 102 years old. He's always said, son, the ground before the cross is level. Everybody's equal. Yes. The ground before the cross is level. Amen. Amen. But we owe the gospel. Paul made three statements there in Romans chapter one. He said, he said, I'm in debt. I'm a debtor. And he said, as much as in me is, I'm ready. The church has never been ready. The church has never ever been ready. Paul says, as much as in me is, I'm ready. And then he said, and I'm not ashamed. Yeah. And the church has been ashamed. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm not going to bring my, my boss to church because old sister whooping diddle may, may speak in tongues. Pastor may take up three offerings. Brother Noel may cut down here on the bucking wing, man. I mean, he may get to dancing. Somebody may run around the building. And that would embarrass me. I'd be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Amen. Paul said, I'm in debt. Say, I'm in debt. As much as in me is, I am ready. And I'm not ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power it's the power, it's the power, it's the power of God unto salvation. 
Amen. You know, Honduras, as Renee said a while ago, they, they asked me to do a one-night crusade. I hate doing one-night crusades because the first night is, is the one I hate the most because people don't know what you're going to do the first night. So they're curious and they're, some, you know, they're throwing rocks at you and calling you names and you know, they just come out of curiosity. What are you doing here? And, you, and so you, know, you need God to pop some miracles that first night and then the second night they say, oh, I know what's going to happen now. And the third night they say, whoa, I'm going to know what's going to happen. And the fourth and fifth night it just gets better and better and better. But, but when you only have a one night crusade, yeah. then that's the first night. Yeah. Right. You don't get a second night. Right. And so we were in the Olympic Stadium and, and, and not only that, it started raining. And people came and came and they stayed. And uh, they sent me numbers and said there was 20,000 people there. I'm not sure there was totally 20,000 people there in the rain, but there was a bunch, there was way over 10,000. And, and I've done this a few times over the years, but they said there's, they said there's 20,000 people there. But I know we had thousands and thousands saved, born again. I know we had miracles and miracles and guys holding their crutches up. And, I mean, just, you know, wonderful miracles. And because it's the power of God. The gospel, my dear friend T.L. Osborne used to always say, Terry, the gospel brings dignity. It brings dignity. It, it takes an old beggar and turns him into, you're not a beggar anymore. I've preached so many times in India and other places where, you know, the caste system says, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your daddy was a beggar, your grandpa was a beggar, and you're, you're a beggar, and your son's going to be a beggar, and your grandson's going to be a beggar, and if your mama was a your grandma was a prostitute, then your daughter's a prostitute, and your granddaughter's a prostitute. Nobody can ever, ever change that. And I've preached a message called, You Can Change Your Destiny. The gospel can change you. The gospel. The gospel is the only thing that can change your destiny. Thank, thank God. Thank God. Well, let me talk to you a little bit tonight. Y'all tell me when to quit. <clears throat> long as I've ever preached this ten and a half hours in one service. In fact, we were just in Australia for a month, as Renee said, and as Morgan said, and uh, we, we had 25 services in 30 days and uh, preached all over that nation. It's the same size as America, 3,000 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep. We, we were east coast, west coast, south coast, not much up north. And, uh, and so we preached and preached and preached and preached. But 42 years ago, I was there and had a service that went 10 and a half hours, and God did miracles and miracles and miracles. And the people that were there 42 years ago have always called it the Wednesday night. So Renee had never been to Australia before, so she got to meet a lot of my old friends and, and made a bunch of new ones. And, and they'd come to her and they'd say, they'd say, Miss Renee, we, I was there the Wednesday night. I mean, it's 42 years ago. I, you, you remember a service, you was a Wednesday night service from 42 years ago? No, but they remember that one. And they said, we, we, we were there the Wednesday night and I was healed and I'm still healed. One guy, told Renee, one guy told Renee, he said, uh, I had two, two wisdom teeth on the bottom that were just miserably hurting me and been hurting me for a long time. Horrible. And that, night, that Wednesday night, God dissolved them. They just disappeared. <laughs> you know, the people said, you know, we got our teeth filled and we went to the dentist. And the dentist didn't know what the filling was. They couldn't figure out what the filling was. And then just, you know, just blind eyes open and deaf ears unstuck. I mean, just in a, just in a Wednesday night church service. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like this. Just in a Wednesday night church service. Marvelous, wonderful miracles. But anyway, um, hell hates you. Hell wants to kill you. Hell has a target on your back. And hell wants to shut the church down. And the scripture says if you smite the shepherd, you'll scatter the sheep. That's why they told us in the military. They said, never, never and you're in combat, never go up and salute an officer because the, the enemy is out there looking through binoculars. And they see you salute somebody, they'll know who the leaders are and they'll kill him. You know, so, so don't do that uh, because they're looking to kill the leader. Yeah. The, hell, hell doesn't have any new ideas. He just does the same ideas. Yeah. Hell's, the devil's not a creator. He doesn't get new ideas. He just does the same thing that's always worked for him. And so he tries to kill. That's why he attacks pastors. Yeah. And we need to pray for our pastors. And... Uh, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about how I've won some battles mm -hmm. and how you can win some battles. Amen. In fact, how you can win every time. Amen. You should win every time. Amen. We're, we're, we're playing a game of life and death. And, and if, if you don't win every time and you lose that last one, then, oh, yeah, right. yeah. you know, <laughs> then there won't be another. We just cop out and go to heaven. Yeah. 
We win anyway. But uh, I, when I, I, the, the, the couple of times I've ministered to you before, uh, I talked to you about some testimonies that the Lord specifically told me to tell in, 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 in great men of God, fathers of mine, Oral Roberts and, and Brother Hagen and, and, and T.L. and different guys like that, ordered me to tell. They said, if you don't tell those everywhere you go, you're missing God because people need to hear what God has done. And just chewed me out about it because I, 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 I just always thought, hey, if it's over two weeks old, don't tell it. Just get another one, you know. <laughs> Oral invited me to dinner one time, and, and I, just as I was sitting down at the table, he said, Terry, you're missing God, and I just froze. I mean, mid, mid, I just sitting down in my chair, and I just froze. And I said, what am I doing? I don't want to miss God. He said, no, sit down, sit down. He said, uh, he said you're missing God because you don't tell your, your hitchhiker story very much anymore. Whether You picked up the hitchhiker, and he pulled a gun on you and said he's going to kill you, and you said, you can't kill me. I'm a man of God and got authority in the name of Jesus. He shot at you five times. The bush didn't hit you. He said, you, you, don't, you don't like to tell that, do you? And I said, well, no, sir, I really don't. He said, you feel like that's, that's old, and it's so old, and God's done so many other things that you'd rather just tell those new things. And I said, well, that's exactly how I feel. He said, well, you're missing God. He said, that story is so, that testimony is so powerful and so great. Brother Osteen called me up and told me almost word for word the same thing. He said, he said that, that testimony, he said, it belongs in, he said, I tried to put it in uh, several of my books. He tried to put it in, I wanted to put it in, in demonstrating Satan's defeat. This, Brother Osteen said this. I wanted to put it in demonstrating Satan's defeat. I wanted to put miracle in your mouth. I wanted to put it in this book, this book, this book. Finally, he put it in a book uh, called The Believer's Number One Need, which is righteousness, and said, because I was in right standing with God, then God honored and, and, and he, But he said, that, 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 that people got to hear that. People don't hear those kind of things. That, so that's, that's a, and so, uh, and Oral said to me, he said, uh, you know my sermon, The Fourth Man? I said, well, of course. Who, who, everybody knows your sermon, The Fourth Man. And he said, well, that, I don't like it. He said, that's not my favorite sermon. He said, but if I don't preach it everywhere I go, I'm missing God. He said, I have to, I have to preach that everywhere I go. He said, you have to tell that. And so I've told you all that story. And, uh, and, and, and I've told it in church after church. I mean, it, that happened 50 years ago this next month. October the 16th, it was a Wednesday. 1974, and I was driving through Mexico and picked this guy up, and here we go. So, so, so next month will be 50 years. And so I've told it for 50 years around the world. And I usually tell it pretty fast. I just kind of buzz through and hit the high points and, and don't give all the details. Some, sometimes I like leave out major details, you know, because they're just, the clock's ticking. And my, I only have two enemies, the clock and the calendar, and they're always marching. <laughs> And especially in today's church. I mean, used to, you could take a little longer, but now folks get nervous. Uh, but, uh, but I've always just kind of blown through it. And then, and then I've told you all the story about having a little, little infant in Guatemala, American medical doctor, a friend of mine was with me, and, and this little 13-day-old baby girl died, and he pronounced her dead. And I just grabbed her up and held her up before God and began to pray. Uh, and uh, it took 12 hours. When I picked her up to pray, I didn't have any concept it'd be 12. I'd raised other folks from the dead before, and it was just kind of pretty quick. This was 12 hours. And after nine hours, the doctor said, Terry, and I'm holding her, honey, I'll not bury you. Sugar, you'll live and not die. You'll live and not die. You hear me? You'll live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I'm not going to bury you. And finally, the doctor said to me at 3 o'clock in the morning, he said, Terry, Terry, and he grabbed my arm and said, Terry. And I said, what? He said, I'm concerned about you. He said, uh, she's dead. D-E-A-D, -E -D, dead. He said, now put her down. You've been carrying her around, talking to her, praying for her. Put her down. He said, she's dead. We'll bury her in the morning. Let's go get some sleep. He said, I did everything I could as a doctor. It didn't work. You did everything you could as a missionary. It didn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. She's dead. He said, you've been at this nine hours. I didn't have any idea I'd been at it nine hours. He said, you've been at this nine hours. And put her down. I said, Doc, you, you leave me alone. Now, he didn't do anything wrong. He's a good guy. He's a word guy, faith guy, you know, great guy. Um, but he's a doctor. I mean, he, she's dead, you know. And I've been dead for nine hours. And so uh, I said, I'm not going to bury this baby. Now, if you want to go to bed, go ahead. But I'm, I'm, I've got a job to do, and I'm going to do it. Well, three hours later, 12 hours now, uh, she started crying. God raised her up. 
And so I, I've often thought, what if I'd have quit at 11 and a half hours? What if, what if I'd have quit at nine hours? What if I'd have quit when the doctor said to quit? What, what, I mean, I had no idea it was going to be 12 hours. I had no concept. But you know, I learned something from T.L. Osborne decades ago. He said, he said, Terry, always stay till the devil wins. Excuse me, always stay till the devil leaves. If you want to win, you're going to have to stay till the devil leaves. He said, most Christians just run in, pray some little charismatic prayer and then run out. And the, the, the devil never left. He just stayed there. He just, he just kind of moved when you walked in to pray and then you left. He just got back where he was. But you're going to have to stay till, till he leaves. Just little golden nuggets like that from some of these generals. That's why it's so important to have fathers in the faith, mothers, mothers in the faith. That's why it's so vital that you listen to them. Whether you, whether you agree or not, do, you obey. Amen. Amen. I've had my fathers in the faith tell me stuff that I didn't more agree with than nothing. I thought, I don't think that's right, but I'm going to do it. Why? Because my, my father in the faith told me to. Two of them are gone now, been gone for, I mean, a bunch of them are gone now, but, but two in particular uh, that I disagreed with them about something and, and did it very respectfully and said, I'm not trying to cause trouble, Dad, but just talk to me about this. Why, why do you say this? And, and so, you know, I said, I'm going to do whatever you say, but I, I just want to know what the reasoning is, you know. But when he finished his reasons, I didn't agree with it. Told him I didn't. But I said, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm with you. I'm not going to cause you any trouble. I'm with you. Well, he's been gone a long time, and I, I, I'm, I'm still honoring him, you know. Another one told me something, you know, and, and not to do, and I didn't agree with him. Still don't. And he's been gone 25 years. And I'm still not doing what he told me not to do. <laughs> even though I disagree with him to this day. And even though other preachers disagreed with him and went and came to me and said, you ought to do that. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. That's good. Yeah. Well, why aren't you? Well, because Brother So-and-So told me not to. Yeah, but he's gone. I said, I can't help that. Yeah. Yeah. He's my daddy. He's my, he's my spiritual father. He didn't, he didn't like it. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't wrong. I said, I know it wasn't wrong, but he didn't like it. You know, the things that these, are, these generals tell us, that these, as Renee said, we stand on the, we stand on the shoulders of, of giants. We, we didn't just think this up ourselves. People need to know where we got what we got. We didn't just, we didn't just wake up one morning and know all this stuff. We didn't, we didn't get this out of the cabbage patch. We, we, we got it from somebody. And we know where they got it from. I want to talk to you just a minute about a famous old preacher, a real hero of mine. He's in heaven today, been, been gone for quite a while, but his name was Oswald J. Smith. He loved missions and wanted to be a missionary. That's all the man ever wanted to do is be a missionary, but he couldn't do it. He tried. He went overseas over and over again. And uh, finally, he, God got it across to him to pastor a church in Canada and quit and do missions, but quit trying to go overseas and be a missionary. And so uh, there was a church in Toronto that needed a pastor. When he got there, they said, now look, we're deep in debt and we want you to preach Sunday morning and we want you to preach Sunday night. We want you to mention the debt, talk about the debt and raise an offering to, to deal with the debt. And so he got up Sunday morning and preached and he preached on missions to everybody's surprise and never one time mentioned the debt. They said, why don't you stay over and preach next Sunday? Now listen, we're deep in debt. We want you to take up an offering. We want you to get this debt taken care of. And so he preached Sunday morning on missions, never mentioned the debt, called an afternoon meeting for 2.30, preached on missions, never mentioned the debt, preached Sunday night on missions, never mentioned the debt. For some crazy reason, the board decided to hire him as their pastor. And so he preached for a solid year, never one time mentioned the debt, preached on missions every time. But because they gave to missions and believed in missions, God paid their debt off. So at the end of the year, he got his report from his, his bookkeeper, his CPA, and the bookkeeper said, you gave seven times more to missions than you spent here at home. And I want to read you something that he said that I've lived by and I've preached around the world. He said, number one, if I refuse to give anything to missions this year, I practically cast a ballot in favor of the recall of every missionary from the field. 
Number two, if I give less than I've given before, then I favor a reduction in the forces of missionaries proportionate to my reduced contributions. Number three, if I give the same as I've always given, every year give it the same, then I favor holding the ground already won, but I oppose any forward movement. My song is hold the fort, forgetting that the Lord never intended his army to take refuge in a fort. All his soldiers are commanded to go. And number four, he said, if I increase my offering beyond former years, then I favor an advance, an advanced movement in the conquest of new territory for Christ. And you know, I took that to heart when I was a missionary and all these years I've been in the ministry. I mean, all these years uh, at the beginning of every year, I tell the Lord, I'm gonna give more this year than I gave last year. I'm gonna give more this year than I gave last year. And we've been able to do that now for over half a century and God has blessed it and blessed it and blessed it, it's proven. And uh, I invite you to get involved in giving to missions as well. And if you'd consider, prayerfully consider, partnering with Renee and I, partnering with Terry Mize Ministries as we go around the world, then I promise you this, I will pray for you. Renee will pray for you. Our staff will pray for you every day, every day, every day. And according to God's word, he will bless you and minister to you and keep his word to you. I believe you'll find missions giving is gonna be your greatest asset and your greatest return on your giving that you've ever had in your life. God bless you. We love you. You're more than conquerors. When I first got out of the Army, I went straight to, the, to Mexico to the mission fields. And uh, I, I spent time with a missionary named Wayne Myers, still preaching. And I ran into a lifestyle that absolutely pricked my heart, grabbed hold of me. I saw a, a man that was living to give. I mean, he, he was he was living his life on planet Earth with the purpose of blessing somebody, lifting somebody, embracing somebody. And I saw that. I said, ah, this is it. I, this is the I'm, I'm embracing this. And I right there made a vow to God and to myself. And I said, this is how I will live the rest of my life, living to give because it's the very nature of God. So I want to encourage you to hook up with that same lifestyle of giving. I mean, embrace it, living to give. And you can give to your local church. You can give to other ministries. I've partnered with ministries since around the world since I was a teenager. And I tell you, God's blessed me for it. I wouldn't trade it. You can also partner with us. We're always happy to em embrace partners. We pray for them every day. But as long as you hook up with that concept, that lifestyle of God, living to give, then it'll be a blessing to others and it'll certainly be a blessing to you.